Good afternoon. I'm Bruce Gunther, the chief curator here at the Portland Art Museum and the host curator, part of the curatorial team for the Louvre Suileries Gardens exhibition. I'd like to welcome you to the first program in a series of lectures and events around this historic and uh, important look at the park and its role in a city, in a country, and the world that the Louvre's Tuileries Gardens represents. Um, we are going to look at landscape architects, um, politics, social uh, impetus uh, uh, for parks, and also the future of parks in this program put together by the Education Department and the Museum. Um, from a historic park to the presentness of the parks of Portland. We hope you'll join us over the course of the summer for a series of, I think, exciting and challenging dialogues about the role of green space in our personal lives and our community's life as we look at this great monument to world culture, the Tuileries Garden, and um, our own Olmsted-inspired gardens of Portland. Um, today, it is my honor to introduce a colleague and now a friend over the last two years of organizing and working with this exhibition, Dr. Richard Putney, uh, who received his PhD in medieval art at the University of Delaware, did not stop him from then embracing all that came la uh, uh, later, including a passion for Paris and the garden. He is the consulting curator for medieval art at the Toledo Art Museum and their consulting curator and team participant for the Tuileries Garden exhibition. He led the creation of the Department of Art at the University of Toledo and went on to teach art history there since 1979. He served both as chair and um, hiring aficionado. His passion for architecture has perhaps led him to make a lasting contribution to the cityscape uh, and the community of Toledo by his contributions and advocacy for two major buildings in Toledo, the Frank Gehry Center for Visual Arts at the University of Toledo, a landmark uh, building in institutional learning, and the Sana building, the Glass Pavilion, celebrated worldwide for its innovative use of glass and their first project in the United States. Um, Dick was an advocate, a spokesperson, and a fighter in the trenches to make sure those buildings happened. And it was as a part of the curatorial team representing the Toledo Art Museum uh, that I got to know him, his sense of humor, his depth of knowledge of history, his passion for La Notre, and fine cuisine and French wine. Uh, <laughs> Dr. Putney provided a wonderful core essay for the catalog on the Louvre Tuileries Garden publication. He provided the spirit that forced us to include a, a palace that was a ghost, uh, an architect who was present, and a lot of fun on the trips to Paris and Toledo and Atlanta. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Richard Putney. Thank you, Bruce. It's wonderful to be here in this incredible city. It's my first visit. My wife and I have come out for the opening. It's an extraordinary city, an extraordinary museum. We have not seen everything we want to see yet. We have two more days. Uh, so it's just wonderful to be here. And it's been extraordinary working with the Portland team, particularly with Bruce, uh, going to restaurants, getting drunk. Uh, no, 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 not at all. I actually don't drink wine. This is uh, vodka in the water bottle here. <laughs> No, I don't drink at all, actually, but we've had a wonderful time working together. Uh, my favorite moment, I think, in the creation of this exhibition was working on the film, uh, and in the film, listening to Bruce's, we had a collective phone call around the country, uh, Atlanta, Toledo, and Portland, and he, I wish I had recorded his comments on some of the things that were cho chosen for the film. Uh, it's just been a really wonderful experience. Uh, well, tonight I'm going to talk uh, on a personal level, and not with great expertise, I must say, about André Le Note, who was the great, uh, I like to call him not a gardener, but certainly a landscape architect of the Tuileries Garden. And I'm going to first introduce you just a little bit uh, to the Tuileries Garden, and then talk about the history of that site very briefly, and especially the contribution of André Le Note. 
uh, tell you a little bit about him. He was an amazing, amazing person, and he's someone who I've investigated very closely uh, during the run of this exhibition, uh, both in Atlanta and here, and I've just come to admire him uh, tremendously. So, uh, in search of Andre Lenote, wanted my it's a personal search, and looking for him, I wanted to know what was he like, what did he look like, what did he know, how was he educated, what was his expertise in, how was he creative, all of these things uh, have been of great interest to me, and I've gotten maybe a quarter of the way to where I want to be, uh, but we'll do the best I can for you tonight. Uh, this is a satellite view of modern Paris. Uh, the yellow line represents a huge traffic jam which runs every morning and afternoon. <laughs> Uh, on the road which today replaces the old 19th century walls around Paris and today is uh, what we used to call in Philadelphia the Schuylkill Express, we called it the Shorekill Expressway. It's kind of the Shorekill Expressway of Paris. And Paris is kind of like a roughly lumpy sort of clock um, roughly circular in shape. And at the very heart of Paris, near the center, uh, within this green rectangle, is the great complex of the Louvre and the Tuileries, which began certainly on the edge of the city and today is really the heart, uh, certainly the cultural heart of the city. Um, here is a, a map. Um, I was really surprised to find out. I went on Google Maps and found out that the entire building of the Louvre had been painted red. I didn't know this had happened. Uh, but to make them very stand out distinctly, I wanted to show you the complex as it looks today. And one of the things I want to do is to just have a little fun with you. I like to do this with all of the groups. I'd like you to hold your hands up in the air as if a touchdown has just been scored. We'll see how very good. This is so cool. I wish you could see this. Um, <laughs> but I'd like you to think of uh, your navel, holding your hands up. Your navel is essentially the courtyard of the Louvre. It's the big red square on the right uh, of the, of the uh, diagram. Your head is the Great Pyramid by I.M. Pei, also in the outer courtyard of the Louvre. Uh, and then um, your hands above come right to the edge of the Tuileries Garden, the great green rectangle you see in the upper left, sort of slanting off to the upper left. Now between your hands, I can see fatigue has set in. Uh, <laughs> Uh, between your hands is, uh, is a ghost of a building, we might say. Between your hands uh, once stood a great palace. This was the Tuileries Palace, which was uh, begun in 1564, as you'll see. That was really wonderful to see that. We need a video camera right up here. Uh, was begun in 1564 and destroyed in 1871 and went through a tremendous development, which I'll very briefly uh, outline for you. Uh, and the Tuileries Palace stood, you can see at the end of those two red arms, which were your hands, there once was this great Tuileries Palace, which developed over time, as did the garden in front of it, and which was part and parcel of its, uh, its design. Uh, this is a view that's in the catalog, a wonderful uh, photograph taken of the length of the great Tuileries Garden, which still stands. And we look uh, down its central axis, a long, long view through the garden. It's about 2,000 feet long. It has about 64 acres within it, and about 10 million people a year uh, visit it. Uh, today, it is essentially, it's much like Central Park in New York. It's a public space. People come there to, to read, to doze, to meet with friends, to sail sailboats. Uh, all kinds of social activity take place here. It's also a venue for contemporary sculpture, contemporary exhibitions of art, uh, also for dining. So it's a really wonderful social space. But in the very foreground of that photograph, we see two corners of a green lawn. And that's the site of the former Tuileries Palace, which was hundreds of feet long uh, and which was closely associated with, indeed designed with, the great garden which lies in front of it. Today, uh, just above my little title there that says site of the Tuileries Palace, um, a set of steps. There is a, a kind of an embankment that leads to a set of steps in the foreground. And down those steps, you go directly into the 2,000 foot long central axis, so powerful, um, of the Tuileries Garden. And we'll talk more about its extension into space at the end of the talk today. Now, to say it briefly, um, Catherine de Medici began this great, uh, great complex. Uh, she designed, had designed for her um, a great palace. A model of it is in the exhibition, which is quite extraordinary. And interestingly, in Toledo, it was one of the most uh, difficult things to install due to its delicacy and its not quite level uh, relationship of part to part. Uh, so we spent a lot of time, actually three hours, just laying that in a case and getting the vitrine on top of it. In front of it was designed um, a great garden designed by an Italian architect, Catherine de Medici. She was a Florentine by birth, and she brought with her from Italy many of the great um, knowledge of many of the great developments, certainly, that had been taking place in the art and architecture and landscape design um, of, of Italy. 
The palace looked um, something like this. This is a model, as I said, it's in the exhibition. Uh, the red arrow points to it. Uh, and beyond that was the garden, and that garden uh, very definitely was meant to be part and parcel uh, of, the, uh, of the, the chateau itself, the great palace itself. Um, it uh, shares a central axis with it. That's something very much in an Italian style that was developing, as particularly in the 15th and 16th centuries uh, in Italy. Um, it is not at all like the garden today because this garden was destroyed during the wars of revolution after the, certainly after the death of Catherine de' Medici. So the palace uh, combined with the um, architecture, we could say the landscape architecture of the garden, bring together some very important trends in the history of art, architecture, and landscape design. Uh, first of all, in, uh, just in a very general sense, in Italy at the beginning of the Renaissance, very slowly and passing to France with a uh, movement of French people into Italy and coming back, there was a great shift which took place in the architecture of both Italy and France. And in France, the chateau, the castle, turned from a defensive building like what you see at the upper left, entirely functional in terms of its design, uh, into a beautiful kind of residence which was more open, sometimes had um, sort of symbolic references to military architecture, but had many more windows, would be relatively difficult to defend. And so a very new kind of both royal palace and uh, noble residence emerged in the architecture first of Italy and then passing on uh, certainly to France. Another great development beginning in Italy, which also passes on to France and is crucial to understanding the uh, wonders of the Tuileries uh, Garden, is the system of linear perspective, which allowed for paintings like, of course, Leonardo's Last Supper, in which a system of orthogonals, a horizon line, and a vanishing point allow us to uh, see a very clear, very rational space and to place figures and objects in very, very uh, specific places. I wanted to mention that recent research has shown that Leonardo did not use an Etch-a-Sketch to design uh, The Last Supper. <laughs> However, seriously again, uh, Leonardo and many other artists in Italy, and this also passed of course on to France with Renaissance ideas, were very, very profoundly interested in the perfect execution of a linear perspective space. And this also is crucial to the understanding um, I think it will seem obvious, of gardens as well in this new style which is emerging. And so um, one of the real interests, of course, was perspective. And interestingly, um, in Italy, except for one city that I know of, Pienza, there is no known real large public space or urban space that was designed to actually make use of perspective, to design using perspective in three dimensions. Ideal cities were designed as in the painting on the screen, but only one place that actually my wife and I are aware of, we're both uh, art historians, uh, and that's Pienza, a public square, made use of perspective. However, a place where perspective was used in the true third dimension were in the new kind of formal gardens, Italian formal gardens, which were emerging particularly during the 16th century, in which a very classically shaped building, not looking at all military, would be joined, as in the uh, Boboli Gardens with uh, the Pitti Palace on the left, probably difficult to see in the back row. Uh, but that very much more classical building than a medieval building was joined sharing its central axis with a garden. And on the right is a view which I took recently at the Villa d'Este in Tivoli showing a layout of uh, various parts of the garden united by uh, their organization along a single axis which gives it a very strong uh, sort of statement in perspective. So all of these things were uh, very much part of the Tuileries the first Tuileries uh, complex of Catherine de Medici. New things came, very important to us, and very important to the city of Paris even today, happened um, to around 1600 under King Henry IV, good King Henry, and my wife and I love this, this king because of what he did for the city of Paris. Many things you can still see. And one of the things he did was to join together the Louvre which is the, the square building at lower right in the slide, a sort of a gray square, he built arms that came forward 1,500 feet to join the Tuileries Palace, which was extended in length so the two could be joined together. And you'll be able to see this in the extraordinary model in the collection um, upstairs. Uh, he also remodeled the garden, which uh, had been destroyed during the Wars of Religion, although this was not the final design, as we'll see. 
But this long arm of the Louvre, and here it is, uh, on the right of the screen is the Louvre itself, the very edge of the courtyard where the Louvre first started as a castle and then was converted into a royal residence. And then all along the river, this extraordinary length of building, 1,500 feet long, a single building, uh, joined that courtyard of the Louvre, going actually across a medieval wall and joining with the Tuileries Palace. Uh, with the Tuileries Gardens just beyond. So suddenly this was really not two different complexes, but a single complex, as it is today. So the Gallery of the Louvre was very important architecturally, very important in bringing together the Louvre and the Tuileries Garden, and it was also especially important because this gallery was designed not only for royal use, but was also used to help energize the, certainly the cultural uh, and the economic aspects of a burgeoning city. Uh, Paris was very definitely developing into one of the great cities of the world, and certainly the Western world, certainly of Northwestern Europe. Uh, and King Henry wanted to promote the arts, the crafts. He wanted to promote uh, surveying. He wanted to promote uh, the development of painting, the arts, sculpture, etc. cetera. Uh, so these became places where he literally gave spaces to great artists, great craftspeople, uh, people who were interested in the sciences and thought. And so essentially that gallery became kind of a university full of new ideas, new crafts, uh, and it brought together the arts and the sciences, no question. Well, very important to our story is, of course, King Louis XIV, um, the great king who would eventually build uh, the great palace of Versailles, which really will not appear to today at all. Uh, but he was very, very important for the history of Paris, even though he detested the city of Paris. But he thought that Paris should have the nobility and the grandness of a great capital city, even though he will eventually move to Versailles to get away from Paris, which he didn't like for political and uh, maybe cleanly reasons, I'm not sure, uh, but reasons of cleanliness. But what he decided to do was to make the Tuileries Garden and the Tuileries Palace um, something very, very grand now that it was joined to the Louvre. And so for his project, he made the Tuileries Palace much bigger, much larger. He added a floor to it, and he employed Louis Laveau, one of the great architects of 17th century France, who would also design uh, major portions of the Palace of Versailles. Uh, he employed him to make the Tuileries Palace much longer, and he added a floor to it, literally almost demolished the old building and completely rebuilt it. And on the screen, you can see outlined in red that new palace, which is much, much wider, certainly much longer, uh, and one of the beautiful drawings uh, created in Louis DeVoe's shop, and was actually was part of the venue in Atlanta, that actual drawing of this, uh, this exhibition. And so Louis Laveau was the great architect, but chosen um, to be the, the gardener, we could call him, uh, for this was Andre the Note, the hero of today's, uh, today's lecture. And he became the architect of the reconfigured Tuileries Garden and Palace Complex. And amongst the things he did, as you will see, is to tear down a wall which once completely separated the garden from the palace. Even though they shared a central axis, they were not really joined together. Uh, so he united with this brand new, very, very grand uh, palace, uh, a new garden which was completely redesigned. It was lengthened and uh, very, made much more complex, as you will see. And we'll talk a little bit about the drawing you see on the screen. That is the high school yearbook of Andre Le Notre on the lower left. Uh, and there is his, uh, from his high school yearbook is uh, the image of his new garden, which we'll come back to in a moment. Now, here's what I want to say. As a person who teaches art history, but in a very general way, I've always described Andre Le Note as a gardener. And he's always talked about as being the great gardener who designed Versailles, for which he's so famous. But I wanted to find out much, much more about him. Um, what did he know? What did he do? Um, what kind of a person was he? What did he look like? Um, I wanted to know many, many things about him. What was his education like? And as I explored this, I found out what a rich life he had left, he had led. Um, he was the descendant of two distinguished gardeners. And when I say gardeners, I mean people who are horticulturalists, but who are also experts in design and experts in management of very, very large gardens indeed. Um, his uh, grandfather worked in the Tuileries Garden, probably at a very high level, and his father was the uh, complete designer, uh, or the complete uh, master of the Tuileries Garden, I should say. Uh, and they had a house in the Tuileries Garden, and that's where Andre Le Note was almost certainly born. So he worked there, and he trained there, and he certainly learned about horticulture, he learned about plants, but he also learned a ton about design, about intellectual aspects of the garden. 
Uh, he also studied in that long arm of the Louvre I mentioned to you with a number of artists and other technicians and many other, not I shouldn't say other technicians, but with artists, technicians, explorers of new ideas. And that's where he received his education, deep education in the liberal arts uh, as well as the, uh, the visual arts. Indeed, uh, he trained for a number of years with Simone Vouet, who was one of the great painters of France during the early 17th century. And in discussing this with the director of our museum, we thought about all the things he, we discussed what he would have learned from this, the use of color, the use of space, perspective, of course, and he used it in a very, very profoundly uh, complex way. So his background was, was not at all um, a humble person who becomes a gardener who then makes his way up to uh, the very top of the chain of command in, in gardens, but he's a highly educated person, very sophisticated, and his entire family had worked in royal circles, not as royalty, certainly, but in royal circles for several uh, generations. So he had a very, very rich background. And to finish today, what I'd like to do is just to give you a tour of a couple of his, uh, his buildings, uh, his gardens, I should say, and his designs, which are quite profound uh, and wonderful to visit today. Almost everybody I've ever talked to has gone to Vaux le which we're going to look at now, has been very, very enthusiastic about the experience. How many of you have been to, to Vaux? Were you enthusiastic? Good. Excellent. Because I'm going to speak for the next seven hours on Vaux le <laughs> But here is an aerial view of Vaux le Vicomte, and the architecture itself was designed again by Louis Laveau, who had done the Tuileries Palace, same cast of characters. And one of the things that was wonderful is the building itself is a great example of French classical 17th century architecture. But what's interesting is how it was completely integrated, much more so than the Tuileries complex when it was first designed in the 16th century, completely integrated into its landscape and its garden. And one of the things that Lenote's very famous for, and I never got this until I did three recent trips uh, to photograph at Vaux le Vicomte and to really, really uh, get to know it much, much better. And one of the things is surprise. One of the things he loved was clarity in his designs, but he also liked to hide things so they would only be revealed to you as you moved kinetically through that, uh, that garden. Well, look at the front of this uh, beautiful palace, and it, it seems to stand grandly on the ground. But in fact, when you approach it, and you would have approached this as a noble person, certainly in a carriage, uh, you would make your way across a drawbridge and discover that it's an island. It's surrounded by a moat, a kind of symbolic reference to uh, traditional nobility uh, when they had castles. But it's a complete surprise, and it's filled with carp, and it's absolutely a uh, totally wonderful place. Uh, there's an aerial view of it, which I certainly did not take. Uh, here's a view I took more recently uh, showing this uh, beautiful moat, uh, which has a forecourt. And then, of course, there's the, uh, the chateau itself. Now, the chateau also joined um, wonderfully in a formal sense with the garden, actually the entire landscape, uh, in that a long axis ran through the entire property, including the area in front of the palace, through the palace, you can see the red arrow indicating it running through the two major rooms of circulation on the lower floor and into the garden itself. And here's a room I would love to own, this one right here. This is the salon of Vaux le Vicomte, uh, who lies, which lies right on the axis of the building and continues for thousands of feet through the great garden of Andre Le Note. It's really just an absolutely extraordinary experience. Here's an aerial view uh, showing this long axis from uh, on at the left side, of course, uh, running from the passageway which comes from the road uh, through a perfectly centered gate uh, through the island, certainly, and the moat and beyond into the garden behind. And it even continues up into trees with a long alley at the very end of the trees, extending that long axis of perspective. Uh, it's absolutely extraordinary. You can see it, of course, in the diagram on the right as well. The little red thing is the, is the chateau. Something I just want to mention here and I'll come back to is he did not come here onto the note and find a flat area all set um, for uh, the building of a chateau. This was very rough, very rolling country, and one of the things he had to do was to manage to completely change the landscape, the topography of the land to design this, as well as to design uh, the individual parts of the, of the garden. Here's a view um, shot from the dome. I'll just go back for a second. There is a dome. You might be able to see it on the top of the building. Some of you may have gone up there, but there's a wonderful view from the dome along the length of the garden itself. 
Uh, and you can see how the topography is quite interesting. It looks at first very flat, uh, but there are various walkways which are raised up, which surround the center portion. Um, the entire thing is enveloped by trees which grow into hills, some of which were artificially made uh, according to Lenotre's design, and go all the way back to a rising hill also artificially embellished uh, by the design of Lenotre with a huge sculpture at the back. The sculpture is actually from the 19th century, but it continues it into what seems almost an infinite sort of perspective. Looking in the foreground, one of the delights of Andre Lenotre's gardens, um, he is said to have been one of the greatest designers of this kind of space. It's called a parterre. It's generally rectangular in its shape, and it often contains beds of hedges and flowers, uh, often with uh, using what was called broderie or embroidery, using particularly hedges and flowers to produce them. Uh, here is a, a shot I didn't take, but wish I had. This is a vertical shot I found in a book on French gardens showing the beautiful broderies in one of the parterres, these uh, sort of geometric shapes, which uh, stand often at the front of a Lenote garden. And so here again, the things you see in green and red, the red is provided, that reddish color is provided by ceramic pots which have been broken uh, with the beautiful green of the hedges. So the play of color is beautiful and the geometry is beautiful, but there's also the play, the curvilinear play, of course, of the, uh, the broderie. Very, very famous for this. Uh, he did not invent, Andre Le Notre did not invent uh, the parterre or a broderie. Uh, they were published uh, long before he was working, but he was considered, while alive, one of the great masters of them, one of the real masterpiece, uh, master workers uh, in the art of the parterre. Now in this shot, you can see, if you follow that central path, you can see a couple little dots. Those are people walking down the center. Uh, he, of course, used water elements as well, and these sometimes were used to reflect the sky. They were thought of as sort of mirrors of the universe, mirrors of the cosmos, as well, of course, being having a delight play when a jet of water was used at their center. Uh, so they had many different uh, functions. But they also function here to drive you, if you're walking down the center of the garden, off the central axis, uh, off to the side. Uh, my wife and I did this uh, first in a golf cart, which we almost disastrously uh, rode off one of the walkways. Uh, we wouldn't be here today if we had done that. Um, but uh, you can walk off of this, and to the left, there's a big surprise, because where that arrow points, this is the view you get, something very close to this. And there's an entirely different garden with an entirely different viewpoint. It's been leveled perfectly and leads up to a staircase which stands in front of a hill. And that staircase was once beautifully covered, embellished with sculpture. It was one of the most famous uh, sculptural embellishments of Vola Bicamp, which was very, very uh, famous in its, its brief day as a great chateau. He also designed cell phones that would go off when you got near the, no. So. He invented the cell phone, actually. You don't... Uh, now imagine walking down to that staircase, uh, you can see it right near the center of the photograph, walking down there, then walk to the right, there's a large hedge which is leading out of the picture, there's some shadows, then turn around and look back where we are, and this is the view which you get. It's an entirely different garden, uh, instead of using parterre made of vegetation and hedges and broderie, it uses mirror-like pools which are parterre, parterre d'eau, parterre of water. Uh, so inc oh, just an incredible ensemble of variety as you move. And this is all surprising. A lot of it you can't see because the garden is not at all flat. It seems at first as if it is, but it's not. Uh, here's a shot from the dome again, and in that red rectangle to the left is another surprise as you make your way toward the end of the garden. Uh, and that is a grotto which he designed. And this, un unfortunately, is a rebuild of the grotto. The entire... Um, garden was restored during the 19th century, so we don't know if everything is accurate. But there was a grotto, an underground space, which had uh, very natural forms within it. But here I point out to his mastery of shaping a space, an architectural object, which you can ascend to get different views of the garden. So if you go up those steps, you step out onto a beautiful terrace, and there's a balustrade at the top of that terrace. And if you step up near that balustrade, you get views of this, this is where you've come from. You can look to the left, and you see a long gravel path running off. And you begin to get the hint to the left 
which you can see fully here, that lying in front of you and completely hidden from you until now is a great canal, which is something like a half mile long. Uh, and it was designed sort of in the shape of a thermometer so that boats could be launched at one end, come down, and in the bulb of the thermometer make a turn uh, to return. Uh, there's also architecture flanking it on both sides. It's just an absolutely amazing thing. The only part you can see uh, from the chateau is the architecture in the background where the hill rises, uh, the beautiful green hill at upper left. And so one of the things I would say again about Le Note is he is an architect of nature. Um, he does not try, he tries to improve upon nature. Uh, he is a designer. He is certainly a landscape architect, not simply a gardener, not simply a horticulturalist. And I say this um, uh, especially because of what's happening in France at the same time as the lifetime of Le Note. Louis XIV uh, wanted to establish very powerful borders for France. Uh, he tore down the walls of Paris. Uh, he only left a couple of triumphal arches designed for him as walls for Paris. So there are no walls of Louis XIV for Paris. But around um, France, down along the border with Spain, with the borders up to the north of France, they were building a whole series of great um, uh, fortresses which were intended for artillery, which of course requires for its effective use on terrain and lines of sight. Well, terrain and lines of sight are absolutely essential to the views in perspective, deep perspective, and the tricks that Andre Le Notre plays sometimes by hiding things from you and then revealing them. And so it participates in a much larger uh, kind of technical discussion which is going on in France, technical and social discussion. This happens to be an image of one of the great Vauban fortresses uh, along the borders of France, <clears throat> which are designed to have very thick walls, but then very thick um, uh, embankments of earth which can absorb artillery shots but also provide for uh, good sight lines which is something you know for artillery it's necessary but something which a gardener also wants uh, uh, to for have you enjoy the great perspective. And this brings us finally to the Tuileries Garden and uh, Tuileries Garden uh, Louis XIV, as I mentioned to you, he decided to embellish it, he built a new palace and he also decided to redo the garden, and of course, who would he uh, entrust with this? Andre Le Note, whom he knew very well. And one of the things I've learned about Andre Le Note is he was apparently a very gracious person, a lot of fun to be with, very intellectual, uh, and the king really liked him and apparently truly befriended him. Uh, the king did not have a lot of close friends. Uh, he didn't like people to be uh, too close. He had some very close mistresses, so of course. Um, but uh, very few people that he probably would have considered as friends. And apparently, the sharing of the joy in the garden is something they had together. So he chose this person who had been associated, whose family had been associated with royal, the royal family uh, for many, many decades, for over a century, in fact. And by the way, in the plan, which Lenotra comes up uh, with, on the left side of the screen, if you look down at the bottom, that little red house, that is the site of Lenotra's house. That's where he was born, that's where he lived, except when he was out on the road designing gardens, uh, and it remained in the family well after his, uh, his death. So here is the design, and I want, what I wanted to do is to use something that's in the exhibition, which I hope you will enjoy, uh, to explain a little better some of the nature of the garden which he designed. Uh, this is a very famous perspective drawing uh, by an artist named Sylvestre, uh, who went around to many of the great chateaux and gardens and uh, drew them, engraved them, and published them uh, during the 17th century. It's one of the most famous of all the engravings. It's the most famous engraving of the Tuileries Garden. And this is, of course, the design of, of Le Note. And so I'm going to show you some of the basic um, aspects of the garden, which we can see in this image, but also in the garden itself. Now, the garden itself today, um, you can see it in, in the right center of this photograph. You can see where all the trees are. Uh, that's part of the garden, and the green space just to their left. That's the Tuileries Garden today. And what I'm going to use to help uh, just explore it a little bit is to use the great model, a huge model, of the Louvre Tuileries Complex, uh, which is in your exhibition, which is really wonderful. How many of you have seen that yet, the big model? Great. Yeah, it's, it's really quite wonderful. It was designed around 1990 during uh, the uh, design of a new bridge across the Seine. And it, was, it was used to show the neighborhood and to show how things circulated in that area. But here's the area of the, uh, the garden itself. And of course, one of the things we have is a very strong axial path, which, ex uh, <coughs> excuse me, uh, which uh, 
gives you a great sense of perspective running through a perspective uh, recession of space running through the entire uh, garden. And this was really, really much more integrated with the new Tuileries Palace of Louis XIV because Le Note tore down the wall which previously had surrounded the garden. Uh, that was completely eliminated. And so the palace and the garden truly became one. The palace raised up slightly on a terrace, steps led down directly into the garden, no visual separation whatsoever. And today that is still the case. So that long red line you see there is the axial path. Um, which runs through the entire garden. Here's an image uh, which I took a few years ago looking right at the top of the steps through the garden. Uh, it's absolutely amazing. Again, it's 2,000 feet long, uh, and we'll talk more about its extension into space into the city of Paris in a few minutes. By, by the way, uh, he did not design the people who you see walking through the, uh, the garden here. Now, one of the things that he used and was a specialist in, we saw uh, with Volo Vicomp, was the parterre, these beautiful geometric shaped spaces, low, flat, often uh, relying upon the use of line for curvilinear shapes, the use of color from flowers, were parterre. And today, still, the front of the Tuileries Garden uh, has large parterre, quite large ones. They're not the same. Those have been destroyed of uh, Lenote, but they follow the general uh, location of the original parterre. And so the model we see here is 1990, not the time of uh, Andre Le Note. This is a drawing from the time of his lifetime, and this drawing shows the Tuileries Palace, the red horizontal big mass running along the bottom of the picture, and in front of it uh, are the parterre at the very end of the garden. And by the way, at the lower right, That's the house of Lenotre. So he had he was pretty close to the Tuileries Palace and to the garden. That's where he uh, he certainly lived. Today, when you go um, toward the uh, area where the Tuileries Palace meets, of course, the the great arms of the Louvre. This uh, pavilion, which you see here, would be your left hand when you raise them up. We see a very large flat area with lots of flower beds. We don't see broderie in the same way that as had been designed by Lenotre, which you see um, here. But uh, we do see lots of flower beds, flat areas, essentially lawns, uh, and also peppered, of course, with sculpture, um, many of which are relatively recent in date, some of which are copies of quite old sculptures uh, from the time of Louis XIV and slightly later. Uh, here's a view across one of the parterre. That's Louis XIV jogging, of course. And then another thing that was very important, and it's still there, and it's still in its original context, is we saw at Volo Vicomp that he liked to use very much in his designs um, water elements. And so there are three uh, round water features, uh, two of them relatively small and closer to the palace, one larger and on the central axis. This is the one on the central axis I'm showing to you. He made them different sizes so that from a room in the top of the palace where the king could observe the garden, they would appear to be of the same size. So that's a very sophisticated use, certainly, of uh, perspective. I've been amazed at some of the things I have discovered. So here is the, um, uh, the large central uh, water feature in the parterre region. At the back of the parterre region today, and certainly in the time of Louis XIV, and at the time when this garden was completed, uh, under, under the note, you suddenly move from flat areas uh, to areas where trees become very, very, uh, very important. And what, one of the things that was done wonderfully, ah, it's just amazing, by Andre the Note here and uh, also at Versailles, and not so much used at all at Volo Vicomp, is the bosquet. And what a bosquet is is a room, and it's a room that's made of trees. So trees are planted in perfect rows with perfect placements, sometimes in straight rows, sometimes in diamond-shaped patterns, around a central core, which is left open, so it becomes an exterior room open to the sky. Sometimes these were filled with buildings. Sometimes they had theaters in them, open-air theaters. Uh, sometimes they had sculpture in the center. They had many different functions. Uh, many of the great bosquets at Versailles today are in very excellent shape, and you can explore some of them. Most of them today uh, at the Tuileries Garden are uh, become settings, of course, for, uh, for sculpture, particularly contemporary sculpture, and it's a wonderful setting for them. 
One of the things uh, I was mentioning with some of my colleagues here right before the talk is uh, Moliere, and Moliere was one of the great playwrights of this era, and many of his plays were performed in the bosquets or the theaters in the gardens at Versailles, for example, and certainly at uh, the Tuileries. So these were uh, another really important element of his design. And here is a bosquet uh, surrounding, of course, contemporary sculpture. Now something else, so we basically have a front area which is uh, devoted to this flat area of parterre. We have a back area which is bosquet. It's still that way today. Something else he did was to tear down the, the just the, the sort of um, uh, confining walls, we might say, which formed the limits of the garden and replace them with esplanades. These, you could call them walls, but they run down both sides. And what they are is walkways. And uh, the walkways are provided with trees so that you walk down the center of them and you have this beautiful experience, as I'll show you, in perspective on the esplanades. They do form a barrier, keeping who should be out, out, and, and allowing the person inside to feel protected from that environment. But they also are wonderful parts of the garden. So they make use of um, a, a very important function, protection, but in a very different way than simply uh, locking out the outside world. Here's a photograph I took last winter um, where you can see one of the esplanades very clearly. This is looking at, this is your right hand when you raised up your, uh, your hands. On the left is the Rue de Rivoli, one of the great streets of Paris with its apartment buildings. Uh, and the trees you see, denuded of leaves in the winter, are sitting, forming a wonderful allay of trees on the top of the embankment. It has a low wall you can see at their base, and a staircase which allows you to go up to the esplanade or to go to an exit or entrance uh, into the, the great garden itself. Here's a shot I took a few summers ago, um, looking down one of the esplanades. They're so beautiful, and you'll see a number of wonderful photographs in the exhibition, uh, far superior to this. Uh, in which we see um, a wonderful use of this by the photographer. Perspective, perspective, perspective. It's so important to Lenote, and it's so important to many of the artists and photographers uh, who have worked this uh, really quite wonderful landscape. This is, uh, I love this area, this is a huge open space with an esplanade on the right. The Rue de Rivoli lies to the right. Uh, apartment buildings lie to the right. Uh, Bosquets here lie to the left and a huge open area, which looks very open here, but is often used in fashion week uh, for uh, wonderful spectacles of fashion and also is used for a carnival every year uh, in which I've seen very young people take their fathers on rides and make them sick to their stomach. Uh, but it becomes a while, it becomes an absolute carnival uh, during the summer just after this photograph was taken. Someone who loved this space as I do was Child Hassam, whose wonderful painting of the Tuileries Garden uh, was painted here in 1897. You can see the trees of the Esplanade coming in from the right. You can see the apartment buildings of the Rue de Rivoli um, and this great open space. Here's another view of it taken during uh, the winter. And what's really interesting, I think, for all of us who worked on this project, uh, we, we speculated about um, where, where the Impressionist painters who loved this side of the garden because of the apartments, which exactly was the apartment they used uh, to paint from, to paint views down into the parterre and the bosquets of the great Twillery Garden. Uh, and uh, we found out the number of the apartment, but we didn't have the guts to go ring the doorbell. But in any case, um, there are a number of wonderful Pissarro paintings and other uh, artists represented in the show uh, who painted from, they rented an apartment, Monet did as well, and uh, looked down on the area of the parterre across the beautiful expanse of the Tuileries Garden. Looking south, in the distance, you can see the towers of saint Clotilde, the great Gothic revival church, and a little bit of the dome of the Anvilid in the distance. So it's a wonderful aspect, the esplanades and then the relationship to the garden and also to the, uh, the street scene beyond. Finally, the last part of the Tuileries Garden is, um, that was designed by Andre Le Note is a great octagonal basin, which is still there, much larger than the other three. So it would appear uh, to be very grand from a sight line in the Paris, uh, excuse me, in the palace. And that was a good Freudian slip. Um, but the octagonal basin, it is octagonal. It's the original basin is still there. It is enormous, as you can tell from this photograph. A typical day, this is a typical Sunday day, reminded me a lot of what we saw uh, in Portland yesterday in a lot of the public spaces, people in, relaxing, enjoying, have a, having a wonderful time. By the way, your Japanese garden is incredible, unbelievable. 
And then finally, the last, uh, the last element I want to show you from the design is Lenote um, wanted to have the same kind of extent in space, which of course he had at Vaux, but here it was a very, very confined space, only 2,000 feet long for the backyard. Uh, and so he designed what's called the horseshoe, and it's a set of ramps that curve up um, in the shape of a horseshoe and lead to two terraces, which he used to culminate the end of the garden. But he didn't allow the two terraces to come together. Instead, he separated them uh, and he left them empty, the space in between empty. And so, as one person wonderfully said, he opened the garden to the future. And here is a view across the octagonal basin. You can see how huge it is. And left and right, you see lines of trees. And those are up on this terrace that was designed by Lenote. You can see an obelisk, which wasn't placed here until 1843. But it stands in the gap left by him, an opening with a great gate and actually a small drawbridge, which could be used uh, at the time when this was designed, the area beyond Lay Marshy. But he designed um, a wonderful continuous avenue, which I'll show you in a moment, which continued on, which of course will become the great Champs-Élysées. He looked, he left it open, he opened the garden to the future. So visually it was open, and again, it acts with his wonderful use of uh, perspective. By the way, some of the great sculptures of the uh, 17th and 18th century were in this end of the garden, uh, particularly, this is a copy today, but uh, Quasavo's Mercury, one of the great sculptures, I think, of 18th century France. But coming back to Sylvester's uh, wonderful uh, image of the garden, we can see in the front, of course, the parterre, the water elements. We can see some of the bosquet, and we can see the long axis of perspective leading out into what was then the countryside and what is today a dense part of commercial Paris, the Champs-Élysées leading to La Défense with its very tall, uh, tall buildings. And here, again, we come back to this, uh, this modern view. Um, this is what has resulted after the time of Lenote, the long axis of the garden. Uh, in the uh, 18th century and 19th century, they gussied up the area beyond called the Place de la Concorde, adding the great obelisk, and then the great Arc de Triomphe was completed under Louis Philippe in the 1840s. The tall buildings on the horizon are way out in what's called La Défense. So uh, I must say that this architect, this uh, landscape architect, has excited me a great deal. And one of the things I felt I had to do as part of my work is to go to his resting place, which is located, and this will be the resting place of this talk in a few minutes. Uh, I went to the church of San Roque uh, near the Tuileries Garden, uh, went inside, and I knew that from people I had talked to, experts on sculpture, and I'll note that the best likeness of him was a bust, a marble bust done by Quasavo uh, and placed in the church by his tomb. So I walked in and I immediately saw about 40 white marble busts. I looked around, I looked around, and I came in the left aisle to this monument, uh, and it's an inscription in honor of Lenotre uh, by his tomb. But when I looked, I was looking for the bust itself. Where was it? And I looked up, and it was a mimeograph photograph of it. And it said, the original is in the exhibition down at Versailles. So I went down to the exhibition in Versailles and got to see it originally, but they wouldn't let you photograph it. But last month, I went back to the church, and there he was, May 214. There was Andre Lenotre. And I close by saying, Happy Father's Day. Thank you. Thank you so much. Does any, would anyone have any remarks or questions? Yes. I want to know if the fountains were originally part of the design. Yes, they were. Uh, Lenote's design, yes, for sure. Yep. Uh, one of the great fountains at Versailles is right now being reconstructed, the Fountain of Latona. And I w got to watch that both in January and last month. And it's amazing that we were, they're taking out all of the piping that was laid by Louis XIV with the cooperation of Andre Lenote. It would be quite wonderful. Yes, sir. Um, I don't know anything about the plan to rebuild. Oh, you mean the Tuileries Palace? The Tuileries. Yeah, the Tuileries Palace. Yeah, there's, um, uh, that's a pretty radical idea. People sort of laugh about it in Paris, but I think there's some people who are really quite serious about it. But how it would be affected, I'm not sure. Uh, that's a great, it's a bigger question I can certainly answer. But it would actually have, they're going to, they're, they're slowly restoring parts of the garden to the original plans of Lenote. And so I think it would actually have no effect because 
um, the terrace which is there, there in the stairs, are exactly as Lenotre placed them. So I think the relationship would actually be quite good. Yes? Yes. So in the garden, I wonder if you might comment on where is the line for a public garden to be what Well, I can speak best to the Tuileries because today it works very well as a personal space. And that's largely, I think, because of the bosquet. Um, the people like to gather in the parterre areas around the fountains, so that's, that's fun for them, and it's got a very human scale. The famous green chairs of the Tuileries gather around it, and then when you go back into the Tuileries area, there, excuse me, the um, area of the Basques, you, th these are intimate rooms, and there are very many intimate spaces. Um, one of the curators we worked with a lot on the exhibition commented about how Paris is a very crowded, noisy city, uh, and he seeks uh, places in Paris that are quiet, intimate, and human scale. And he tends to go back into the areas of the Basques, um, and that's his favorite place to go because it's less visited by simple pedestrian traffic. I don't know if that answers your question or not, but certainly it feels much more intimate when you get into the area of the Basques. It doesn't seem enormous in scale because you lose some of that, those grand perspective lines. And the other answer to it is the English garden or the Japanese garden. <laughs> Yes. The, all three of the gardens that you show have substantial water features as well as yes. features. And I just wonder, would, would the water features and the sources have sort of engineering elements? Yes. Yeah, I neglected to put into the lecture um, the knowledge of hydraulics, and I have talked to a number of landscape architects, including one today, um, about the importance, of course, of hydraulics in this period. And the hydraulics were not that different, apparently, technologically from the era of the Romans, but a great deal was known. One of the most interesting things in the history of Versailles is the attempt to get water to Versailles uh, because the fountains didn't work that well. So they built the famous Marley machine in the Seine, uh, which I visited Marley twice in the last year and looked at models of the machine. It's amazing. And so the technology was to actually raise water, take it to an aqueduct, and it all depended on gravity, of course, uh, and mechanical raising of the water, which they could do with water wheels. Uh, it was very important. It was crucially important, and it had to depend on gravity. They, they could pump water, but I don't think they could get the pressures to make a fountain work particularly well. Uh, Versailles was notorious for not being able to run all the the fountains at the same time. And apparently what I've read is that Louis XIV would go on a walk uh, to see all the, <laughs> the palaces, and so people would watch him. Okay, he's coming up on Fountain 4. And they would turn off Fountain 3, and Fountain 4 would come on. Uh, and I think this is quite true. But yes, hydraulics was crucial to this. And it, I should have mentioned that, certainly, in the, in the talk. Yeah. You have glasses? Yes. Oh, yeah. It is, yeah. Yes. Uh, I can't comment on it because I, I am as dumb as a post when it comes to horticulture. I, I, I've watched it. I'm amazed by it. My father made me mow the lawn. I hated it. I'm not a horticulturalist. <laughs> it was a big lawn, too. It was like, it was at Versailles. It was very... <laughs> oh. No, I can't, I really can't comment on that. Uh, we've watched, a lot of it's done by hand, which is amazing. We watched some of the chestnut trees being trimmed by a long wooden pole, which had a sickle-like device, and they actually swing that back and forth. Do you remember seeing that, Bruce? Yeah, I think one of the walks we had, we saw that. Very laborious. Oh, yeah. I mean, they lost so many trees in that great storm uh, at both Versailles and... Um, I don't know about Vaux, but certainly they did in the Tuileries Garden. There's a very famous um, contemporary sculpture which is made of bronze, and it shows a fallen tree in one of the, at the edge of one of the Basques. It's quite a beautiful sculpture, and it speaks to that. Yeah. But it's not my area at all. I'm sorry. Yes? Yeah, it's very wide. It's um, opened. Uh, there are, I think, three, ac uh, three entrances on each of the esplanades. There's one at the end which opens on the Place de la Concorde and from the terrace where the Tuileries Palace used to be. They uh, open it up fairly early in the morning, about 7, and they close it. Usually it, it varies by season. 
uh, but they close it a little bit after dark or around dark. Um, I am told that there is uh, prostitution, drug sales, things like that going on in the area. I've never seen it. I've seen lots of pickpocketing going on around the Eiffel Tower, um, but uh, mostly what I see is the sale of g small gold Eiffel Towers. Uh, <laughs> but they do, they do, anybody ever seen that? I'm sure you have. Has anyone ever been offered a gold ring in Paris? The last time someone came up and did it to me was the hundredth time, I took off my wedding ring and I said, did you lose this? And, uh, anyway, no, I, um, it, the access is, is quite public. There's no admission. Uh, one thing I will warn you is that if you need to go to the bathroom in this very expansive space, the bathroom is all the way down by the Place de la Concorde and you better have some money. Actually, earlier than that, there was actually some in the 17th century, but it depended on your costume. You had to be well-dressed, apparently. Um, during the time, I know during the time of Louis Philippe in the early 19th century, um, after the revolution, they made it completely open, and then he closed off part of the garden to make it private and part of the palace again. And he uh, put in a number of embankments, uh, which are today mown by goats. And if you've seen the movie yet, if you haven't seen it, you'll see the goats at work in our, in our film. Uh, but it, it has moved back and forth over time, but it's completely open uh, today. Yes, ma'am. Well, you have the police statement in, but so I'm curious about what gardens you actually visit, what gardens. Oh, medieval gardens? Yeah. Uh, they were often irregular. They were sometimes associated with buildings. I can think of the Hotel de Saint in Paris, um, one, one of the ones that I know. I don't really know the history of the garden, but I went to an exhibition uh, in California on the medieval garden at the Getty, and it, was, it didn't have the regularity of space. And also the associations were not classical. Even though Paris in the 17th century, France in the 17th century was Catholic, most of the imagery was classical, whereas a medieval garden would make allusions through sculpture and through the sim symbolism of the garden uh, to things like the virginity of the Virgin Mary, um, to the Garden of Eden, things like this. And they were not, they were not regular with uh, parterre. They were often practical as well, providing food. Uh, they were done for beauty, certainly, as well, but not the sense of expanse uh, that comes with the age of uh, Catherine de' Medici, certainly, or Francois Premier. Very different. They look different and uh, are smaller, generally. Had it for a day? Could you do this one more time? Raise up your arms. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>